Thank you all for coming to Gallery AWA for um, the first and um, we hope a series of talks that we will host at the gallery. Um, welcome, John, Craig, Tanya. Uh, we are very happy to host you and Shante, thank you uh, for bringing the topic to us. And um, uh, a little background on Gallery AWA. We have been um, um, a gallery for socially relevant art and topics for uh, over three years now. For the first two and a half years, we were in uh, beautiful Brooklyn, and then we moved to Chelsea to um, take the controversial topics that we wanted to feature to uh, the hub of the art district, which is you're in the landmark arts building. Uh, we are in Chelsea. Um, because in Brooklyn, it was great to be there to talk about things, but we felt it's better for the topics and the artists to be in Chelsea. Uh, to give you an example, our first um, uh, exhibition was a group exhibition by 11 Haitian uh, artists on uh, modern day slavery in sugarcane plantations. And my brief to my team was that uh, either get me a cease and desist order from the sugarcane owners or get me, put me in jail, you know, do something that is going to wake, wake people up to, uh, you know, what the issues are as against us being blasé about it and uh, going on with our life without really bothering. Um, so um, we are uh, a not-for-profit gallery. All the proceeds, uh, all the proceeds uh, uh, go to feeding the homeless. Uh, we um, are there Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at Tompkins Square Park at 9 a.m. It's an interfaith uh, group. Uh, you're all welcome to come and join us. Uh, I'm not there every day, every, I mean, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, but uh, uh, if you're coming, uh, it's, a, it's a great group of people. And um, um, we are really thankful for you coming here. It's being live cast on Facebook. So for those of us who couldn't make it, they can go back and visit the video and get a handle on what we're trying to achieve. Um, um, I guess uh, you'll go over the uh, sequence of events and then um, after the talk is done, uh, please uh, stick around, have some wine um, so that we can continue discussing how we can make a difference and how we can impact a change. Thank you, Shante. Thank you, Abe. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. So tonight we will um, start with uh, viewing a teaser from a forthcoming documentary focusing on life after for John Ramsey. Um, we are here tonight to not only focus on his case, but also know that there are others like him that are wrongfully convicted and they are going through this ordeal sometimes by themselves. Um, I've been in his corner since I was like this. <laughs> this is my uncle. Um, and so I, I definitely, this is from the place of my heart, um, but I know there's so many others out there that don't have that kind of support. And I definitely appreciate um, Justin and Abhe to in, in their support of like giving my uncle John a platform to share his story. And I pre definitely appreciate you so much for um, opening up this wonderful space for that. Um, and so tonight we're going to look at first the a teaser video and then dive into some questions. And it's not just for me, you can also ask your own questions as well. Um, just wanted to preface um, who the executive director is of this wonderful video. Her name is Sarah Jane Cohen. She has previously worked at the BBC where her credits included Watchdog, News night and crime watch uk and she's produced so many other documentaries including a series for bravo and she's been working with john for four years in counting i've never met her but i know of her beca because of you know his her connection strong connection with my uncle so before we get into the questions i wanted to show we wanted to share that video with you
when she learned that video. <laughs> Hello? Thank you. That was a, a nice little teaser. The documentary is still being um, finalized and it's not over until his case is overturned. And that's when we're celebrating. That's when this will be complete and um, you have your freedom. And so tonight we are um, joined with John um, by two other people that have been so supportive. I feel like I know you guys already <laughs> through just um, his, his, we're, our talks, we're actually roommates. So um, he's shared a lot about um, the connections that he has with you both. Um, Craig Femmeister. Rester. I was going to mess it up. Um, he is uh, an attorney, but he is also an advocate for those who um, don't have a voice and are wrongly convicted. He searches high and low um, to find those people that need his support, that need his guidance, and to clear their name. And that's what he's doing for my uncle. And I definitely appreciate what you've been doing. And uh, Miss Tanya Williams, she is a retired um, New York police um, officer, but she's a healer and she listens to people and her training has transcended beyond her, um, her title as a police officer. It's more as I'm in, I'm in the community, working in the community, trying to make a difference. And we'll talk more about what she does and all the great things that she has done, that she's accomplished over the years. Um, so the first question is to, um, <laughs> so I guess take us back to when, um, that year when they said, okay, you are, you're arrested, you're being charged for this murder. What, what went on at that point and kind of bring us in, you know, as, as much as you can just summarize, like what has happened since that day, since that moment. Yeah. I was arrested. March 2nd, 1982, when I was arrested, they charged me with second degree murder for a crime that happened in East Flatbush. When I was arrested, it was four months after the crime took place. So they asked me, where was you at on October the 31st, 1981, which I had no idea where I was at, but I know where I wasn't at. I wasn't committing the murder. And back then, you know, we didn't have cell phones where you could backtrack exactly where you was at. I had no idea where I was at. What person, probably in here, you can tell me where you was at four months ago on a particular date. And some of them can't even tell it even with a cell phone. And... Especially with a phone like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was arrested for it. And when I got arrested, I had an attorney. They assigned an the attorney to me. I think his name was, I forgot what his name, Murray, Murray or something like that, because I only had him for maybe two months. And during that time, they put in what they call a discovery, you know, like the bill of particulars, all the excorbitory or inscorbitory information that they have in your case, they're supposed to turn over to you, right? At that time, I didn't know no one else was arrested for the crime. I had no idea. We don't find that out till 30, 20, matter of fact, 24 years later, 25 years later, that I put in for what you call a FOIA request, which is a freedom of information. And I was given a document. And on that document, it had my arrest number. And it had on it also that someone was arrested but they use the term perps with a plural. That mean it was more than one person arrested on October the 31st, the same day and an hour after the crime had happened, I was being charged with, that I was charged with years ago. So when I saw that, I knew I was never arrested October the 31st, 1981. I was arrested on March 2nd, 1982. So that's what started me really researching 
to try to find out who this other party was. Now, once I knew that someone else was arrested, when I came home, that was always my mission to find out who this other person was. Nothing inside the record indicated that anyone else was arrested for this crime other than the co-defendant that they gave me. Now I'm gonna go back to that time. This person gets arrested. When he gets arrested, he gives them my name. He said, John Ramsey and another guy named Lee Ellis. Ironically, Lee Ellis and John Ramsey is the same person, it's me. That's the alias name I used before. So now he got me as two different people playing two different roles that I took him to the apartment and we went to the apartment and got a gun from Lee Ellis. And me and Lee Ellis is one and the same. Me at the time, not knowing anything about, I didn't know absolutely nothing about the case at all. So when I read the confession, but prior to the confession, he said he had absolutely nothing to do with the crime. When the officer asked him, well, do you know anything? No, I don't know nothing. But the guy that you're looking for, his name is John Ramsey. Now, how would this guy know that? How would he know if he's saying he had nothing to do with the crime, how could you include me in the crime if you had nothing to do with the crime? How do you put me there? So now, this is what the police go on. So ultimately, they arrest me four months later. Now, when you get further off into it, you will see that he only did that to protect his brother. The guy that got arrested, or the police report that they turned over to me, unbeknown to us at the time, it was actually his brother. So he used me to save his brother. 35 years later, actually last year, the DA, through their investigation, they goes to federal parole. When they go to federal parole, they surprise him. He don't know they coming. So when they go there, they asking them, well, what happened with the case with John Ramsey? I don't want to talk about this. This was years ago. I don't want to talk about it. So they kept pressing him. He tells them, he says, look, everyone knows he didn't have nothing to do with it. The police know. They know he didn't have nothing to do with it. This is what he tells them. So they try to plan a date for him to come in to get him on tape. He don't come in that day. Two months after that, he comes in. I don't know how they got him, but they had a restaurant with two DA detectives and the DA, Lisa Perlman. They questioning him. And he tells them point blank, that man had nothing to do with it. It was my brother. The reason why I told him that, because I didn't want my mother to lose two kids. So I put it on him. I didn't like him anyway, because he was messing with a girl that I used to mess with when we was younger. I never liked him, and which is true. He never liked me because of the girl that he wanted, and we young, I'm like 18 or 19 years old at this time. And he wanted her, he couldn't get her. So it all rimmed around that. So now here we are. They tell, he tells them everything. How the crime happened and all of that. From day one, I don't know how the crime happened. You ask me where I was at to the day when I met with the DA, I told them I don't know where I was at because I actually don't. Why would I remember that? And the officer said, the detective from the DA's office said, he actually said, I, I wouldn't know where I was at either. The DA actually said that. I wouldn't know. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have emails. We had nothing to backtrack on. So they actually agreed with me. So now <clears throat> we go do the conviction review. We give them all the evidence. They have what you call a Brady issue. A Brady issue is when the DA don't turn over exculpatory information that's in favor of the defendant. They consciously 
deliberately kept that out. There's a detective that interviewed the guy's brother that they gave me as a co-defendant. He interviewed him. So we called him. He's a detective down south. Matter of fact, he's an investigator down in Florida. Unbeknown to him, we was recording the conversation. He tells us, he says, yes, my name is there. My partner's name is there. I had to interview him. I made out a DD-5. A DD-5 is a police follow-up report. He said, I definitely made up one. My partner would have made up one. Now, the DD-5 coincide with the police report. They go together. So now what happened is, he says, I don't know where they at, but I know I made them out. Anything that had anything to deal with this guy's brother being arrested was omitted from the record, completely omitted from the record. We had what they call a Wade Heron, and the Wade Heron, the police get on the stand. This is an identification, Wade Heron. He talks about the arrest of the brother, but he never, or the co-defendant, but he never talks about the brother. There's no way you can talk about one without talking about the other. Now, they want to say, oh, it's, it's not a Brady issue. It's not a Brady issue because he didn't identify anyone. Here we are. Last year, the DA, through their own investigation, they go to Officer Plunkett. Officer Plunkett is the guy that originally picked up both of them less than an hour after the crime happened based on a witness inside the apartment said the two guys that committed the murders in Boney's bar. I wasn't in no Boney's bar. You didn't pick me up. And it says on a police report, based on a description that was given, is the reason why they picked up both of them brothers. Now, keep in mind, the brother originally lied and said he didn't have nothing to do with it. Then he turns around and said, oh, it was John Ramsey. Ironically, the other guy that was picked up was actually his brother. So now when you go through the process of getting into this case, everything becomes clear. They had one witness out of five people. Now, all these people that was in this apartment were smoking angel dust and drinking. Not one of them talk about a scar on my head, none of that. And this scar was more pronounced back then than it is now. Everyone that knows me since the I had this scar since I was 12 years old. They go interview one of the witnesses in the case. And all this is last year. This is what the DA office did. When they go interview one of the witnesses in the case, at trial, she said that the person that committed the murder is the same person that was on the phone on Flatbush Avenue, New Kirk Avenue. She says, that guy came up from there and went and commit the murder. Now, when the DA speaks to her last year, they ask her, what did you do, you and the girls, when y'all came out the store, what did you do? Not one time do she mention the phone. She don't talk about ever going to the phone at all. Now, they had one guy identify me at trial. This guy originally said, I wasn't the guy. Then he told the police, I look like the guy. He leaves the precinct for an hour and comes back, or a few hours, and said, I was the guy. Now, at the Wade hearing, which is the identification hearing, my attorney, Michael Vecchione, is questioning the judge, like, judge, it's obvious that this guy has been coerced because he left the precinct and come back. Her explanation of it, it doesn't matter because he's not a part of law enforcement, so he don't fall under that rule. So Vecchione is arguing, your honor, is a matter of justice. She didn't care about no justice. Now here we are, last year, that same female witness, the DA questioned her, not realizing what she gonna actually tell him. And she tells them, we went to the victim's brother house. And this is after they, he left the precinct. This is the only witness that identified me. 
When they left the precinct, they went to the victim's brother house. When they go to the victim's brother house, he tells them, Yo, your brother got murdered. He got shot. He tells the guy, Dell, which is the only identified um, witness in my case, tells him, I know you had something to do with my brother's murder. He said, no, 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 no. Ain't got nothing to do with the guy is in the precinct. So that's why he turned around and came back to the precinct and said, no, it was, it was John Ramsey, the guy in the picture there. That's who it is. So that was his provocation for coming back because the brother was accusing him of having something to do with it. And that, that was the whole screen of the case. There's no physical evidence. There's nothing, nothing at all that ties me to this case. Other than this fact, there's this guy trying to save his brother. That is the bottom line. Nothing you read in this motion, when you read it, you will see. Even we have an expert witness, identification expert witness from John Jay College. She's the same expert witness that the DA used last year in a case that they overturned in the conviction review unit. And when she read my case, and it's the same DA, it's the same exact DA, when she read the case, she called Craig and told Craig how the hell they didn't overturn this case. I'm going to tell you why in the conviction review unit, and I'm not going to hide it. Vecchion, my ex-attorney, he was, became the chief of rackets in the DA's office. He was the second in command. The chief that's in the conviction review unit, his name is Mark Hell. Mark Hell used to work the homicide zone that they called the blue zone. He wound up getting demoted. And the person that demoted him was Michael Vecchione, my attorney. They had a beef since way back then. They never talked again. In my case, he gave up an affidavit saying, because he was my attorney at that time, prior to him becoming a top DA over Hines. And he gave me an affidavit saying that he never had this police report. You can't dispute him. This is the same guy that was basically all their bosses that's in the DA's office right now. So being that he had a beef with Vecchione, which is, it, it becomes so clear because everybody is scratching their head. How you don't overturn this case? It's clear. So now the DA that we had, Lisa Perlman, she's the deputy DA. Who does she report to? She reports to Mark Hell. That's who she reports to, right? Everyone is trying to figure out. I didn't have attorneys that met with judges and the judges said, I don't, I don't understand how they don't overturn this case. This is Claire Brady. I can prove everything I'm telling you. This ain't no guessing game or none of that. I can prove everything. Everything I'm telling you, everything that's in that motion, whatever is suggested in it is because we can prove it without a shadow of a doubt. I don't care what they say. But I guarantee you, without no question, anything that's in there that we say was said, we can prove that it was said, without a doubt. I didn't have this DA say, how did he get convicted? How did he even get convicted of this? What do you mean how I get convicted of this? Because you withheld information. And you included information in it. You hijacked the truth to impact it with lies. So now, even in my parole file, they had six people pick me out as the shooter. Straight lie. Straight, straight, straight lie. One person picked me out in court, and that person lied. In my parole thing, when I'm going to parole, I'm telling them, nah, I ain't saying I did anything. Well, Ramsey, let me tell you something. You got six people. They got six people on this paper identifying you as a shooter. I'm telling the parole guy that never happened. It never happened. 
You can go through any transcripts anywhere. You will never see no six people pick me out of anything. And that's a fact. The DA even said, nah, that never happened. Then how did it get in my file? How did you put that in my file? How? How did that go into my file? So I'm fighting on my case and then fighting with parole. And this, everything I'm telling you, you know, no one can understand what I've been through. You know, the strength that it took me to get to where I'm at. But one thing, I, I will never, ever, ever, ever be broken. Never. And I guarantee you, you can bet on this, that I'm going to expose them so viciously. Because what they do, it, it never stops. You think it stops. Because when you see something that's wrongfully done, if you were about reform, you would correct it right there. We wouldn't have to go through all we have to go through. And she turned around and said, only because I wouldn't go along with her or he wouldn't go along with her. She told us, well, there's not enough to overturn it, right? This is what she says, Lisa Perlman, right? Lisa Perlman says, it's not enough to overturn it. So now I'm laying in bed one night, right? I'm laying in bed. And I'm saying, what does she mean? It's not enough to overturn it. And she said, I'm going to suggest that, you know, they don't overturn it. It ain't enough. But she was hoping, really hoping, that we would turn around and say, all right, we're going to file our motion. Because once you file the motion, it automatically removes it from the conviction review unit automatically, right? Now, I'm in bed one night, I called Craig up. And I said, Craig, no, nah, call her and tell her that um, this is what we're gonna do. Tell her to put her report in. Tell her to put it in. And we told her to put it in she got real agitated about that because now what she actually have to put in, if she don't omit it, they're going to know that you got to overturn this case. Only if you omit. And she didn't set herself, I, I, I don't know how this even happened like this. So now she tells us, all right, I'm a, I'm a, get the star right, but they're going to go with what I tell you to do. This, this is what they're going to do. They're they going to go with it. So in reality, there's no independent board then because she's supposed to make her rep recommendation. So she's recommending that, you know, don't get overturned. So there is no recommendation. There is no actual independent board. If you're saying they're going to go with what you say go, then what is the purpose of having this? It, it makes no sense. So not only are you, you controlling this, you're controlling that. So why have that? It doesn't make sense at all. You shouldn't have it if it's going to go this way. And my case is, is, is so many layers. You know, it, when I say a lot, is a lot of layers. If you read the motion and just go through it, and you will see everything. You will see what expert witness that they use. And I know they can't turn around and say, oh, no, she's not qualified. Because this is the same expert witness you used last year in the Denny case to dispute the victim's claim. I think it was a rape case, Craig, or whatever it was, to overturn a case. So now, if you do that, then that victim in that case has a claim now. Because now you're saying you, you don't believe this expert witness. But you used her in that particular case. And the same expert witness, like I said earlier, it's the same one said, I don't see how she didn't overturn this case. This case is nowhere near, near Dentley's case at all. But nothing made no sense, not even to her. But it makes sense to us because we know the reasoning behind it. Now the cases, it went from conviction review 
to the uh, uh, appeal bureau, to the assistant chief. Now they got it with the general counsel. That used to be, I think, the advisor of Eric Holder in the White House. Now it's all the way there. The thing that we look at or actually don't even see that it's not only, you know, my particular case. I work on wrongful conviction cases. I do investigation on probably about six of them right now. And if you had an idea of what goes on in the DA's office, you would be shocked where you take evidence and you move evidence from one location to the other, you withhold, you know, documents, you force people in the falsely testifying against a person, you hold people in hotels, feed them, and do whatever to get them to testify against a person. I had a case, matter of fact, I still got the case, which is crazy. They used a guy, or tried to use him, and he said that this guy committed a murder. He committed the murder. I seen it when he did it. Come to find out, it was impossible for this guy to commit this murder because he was in jail. Straight up. I'm not telling you no, he was in jail. So imagine if this person wasn't in jail. The crime could have happened in Brooklyn, he in the Bronx. He'd have been sitting in jail for 25 or more years based on what this guy said. But do you think they turned around and do anything to this particular guy? They did nothing to him. They probably used him later on. The same thing with Scott Seller a detective that they overturned, I think it was eight cases, it should be nine soon with the Nelson Cruz case. And they used him. Now this detective used one female, one crackhead female to convict five or six people. Now what person sees five and six different murders? What person sees that? What person actually sees five or six murders? Who sees that? And they use her. And he fabricated confessions. He did all of that. But imagine, imagine if none of that came out. Because there's so much more that don't come out. Imagine if that never came out. All these guys are still be in the penitentiary. Then you got judges, which is really, really sad to me. You would get like the Brooklyn DA's office, they always glorify in the fact that we overturned 22, 23 cases. That's 22, 23 people lives that you destroyed. I lost my sister when I was in the penitentiary. I lost my grandmother, my aunt. I lost countless people. So you glorifying the fact that you exonerated 23 people that should never have been convicted in the beginning. And you glorifying that? Then you got judges, the fact that a judge, you got to understand they don't just deceive me or my attorney. You deceive the judge because the judge is actually going by what you've given them. But you're not giving them everything. So when the judge see he sentenced you to 25 years based on the lack of the information that you never gave him. You never unpacked the truth. You gave him what you wanted and hijacked the truth. And that's exactly what they do. But you'll never hear judges coming out. They should have a beef with this. Not just the attorney or the defense. They should have a beef with that. Because not only we were deceived, you was deceived too. And that's a fact. You had a judge, I think it was two years ago, talking about discovery, them turning over. 
So if you're talking about this in 2000 and something, you kidding me? So you saying the discovery wasn't turned over before? So you should be taking every case and reviewing it. Every case you should be reviewing it. Because if you give an indication that discovery was not being turned over, which is the information, exculpatory, inscorpatory information in a case, whether it's against you or for you, everything's supposed to be turned over. So if you're talking about this in 2016, so how are you not reviewing? So you give an indication that it wasn't done in the past. So if it wasn't done in the past, then what are you telling me? It's supposed to be retroactive. You're supposed to look at all of them cases. All of it. And Brooklyn has a high rate of doing just that. But you think anything happens to them? Nothing happens to them, but everything happens to us. And that's a fact. Everything. They don't realize you in the penitentiary. If I wasn't strong enough and smart enough to make it through it, where would I have been at? You know how many friends I know that hung up in jail, that got stabbed in jail, that got beaten by police? I got beaten by police. They, they, they don't look at that. I don't give a hell if you overturn this now. Nothing can overturn what I've been through. Nothing. Nothing. Not at all. And when you see them up there talking about, yeah, you know, we let this guy, they try to sit on, on your glory. When I went to the DA's office, and spoke to them, I told them straight, point blank, I'm bitter. You get some of these idiots that get their case reversed, they talking about, oh, I'm not bitter. You ain't bitter. So losing family members, none of that makes you bitter. Prison don't make you bitter, and that's where the hell you belong at. Because you ain't got no fight in you at all. You ain't got no business here. Straight up. You ain't bitter. What do you mean you ain't bitter? You looking at your mother go from 35 to 40 to 80 something years old and, and you ain't bitter about that? Is you kidding me? You think this is real glory? That's only the beginning of the fight that you should have had 30 something years ago. The fight don't stop. You think if they overturn my case that, oh, the fight, it, it, it ain't going to stop. It will never stop because I'm going to always have my input in that because of the things they have done to us. And it, it's, it's so clear as day. People look at these cases sporadically, but they put them out sporadically. They know what they be doing. They know certain cases, okay, I'll turn this over this day. We'll wait six months. You'll never ever see them turn over a case back to back, back to back. They know what they be doing. They put it out. So now I, I put out a case here. And you always look at when it's time up for re-election of how they operate. They'll start their fundraiser, and then they start talking about prison reform and all this good stuff. Mm -hmm. Now they got something about parole and all this. Is you kidding me? You can't, you can't be serious about this. Because they are so felonious that it makes no sense. How you going to act? tell the person, oh, I don't, I don't even know how you got convicted. Then you realize that there's evidence that was omitted from the trial. What do you mean you don't know how? That's how. And even with that omitted evidence, you still said, I don't know how you got convicted. So just put all that together. Put everything together. And you're smart enough to realize why. You're smart enough to know that. That's it. Oh, oh my goodness. Um so, um so I wanted to really piggyback on everything that my uncle talked about about his experience. Um I want to echo the fact that this has been happening and continues to happen. What in in your role, you know, just tell us about your experience with like leading the charge at your firm on reversing a lot of these cases. Stand up if you don't mind. I'm sorry. I, I talk with my hands a lot, so I knock things over if I sit down. Um, 
first, I want to I want to thank all of you for coming and showing support. Um, you know, I think it's important. Um, we're using tonight John Ramsey's case as but one example of the system that we live in, and the the fact that if we don't stand up to the system that we live in, this is what happens, right? And it continues to happen. It's happening now. You know, some of you may have relatives or friends or have gone through it yourself. It continues to happen. And he just said something which is exactly um, what I think, you know, the purpose tonight is, is justice without truth. You know, he, Ramsey's case is but one of those cases as an example of justice without truth, okay? You can't have justice without truth. You need the truth to have justice. And that's what we, the people, have to stand up for is the truth. Unfortunately, in our system, because of the way it's set up and the, and the way that we reward um, DAs and, and, and their prosecutors with convictions, and you get promotions when you get more convictions and you win trials, you get promotions, that's bad. Because what happens then, and we do the same thing with detectives. Oh, you solved a murder, you get promoted, now you're a sergeant. Here's the problem, judges, here's the problem. The problem with that system is they will find the straightest line to the end. So if they see a murder case and they're investigating it and they find a suspect, that's it. Now they just look for the evidence to support their conclusion that this is the suspect instead of gathering the evidence and seeing where it leads them. That takes a lot of time, a lot of man hours, a lot of money. So our system has got to change at a fundamental level. And that's the only way we can get truth back into our justice system. Okay, and, and, and Ramsey pointed out, even if his conviction's overturned, his fight's never gonna stop. And thank God for that. Because if we lay down, we'll get run over. We must continue to stand up and fight for truth and justice. And I'm the happiest man on the planet that I ever met John Ramsey here. And I met him about five years ago, four years and change ago when he was released from prison. Um, I was working at a law firm and we were working on wrongful conviction cases. And I remember <laughs> he used to just come in and sit in the lobby of our firm. And, you know, I'd say, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Hey, good, good, good. Boy, day after day, this guy's always in the lobby, just waiting. Never, never annoying, never pestering, always there. And I remember one day coming back from lunch, there he is. And he finally came up to me and, you know, the way he talks is like right here in my face, which is good. I like that. I appreciate it now more than I did then. Uh, listen, you got a minute? I got to talk to you about my case. We got we to gotta talk now. I was like, all right, you know what? Yes, let's talk. But his persistence to this day, and he said, same thing. He's laying in bed one night, and he's thinking about his case, and he, he calls me up. He forgot to tell you. That calls at 1 in the morning. His texts are at 2 a.m. His texts are at 5.30 in the morning because he's persistent and he doesn't give up that fight. And he's been an inspiration for me um, to continue the work that, that I do and convince my law firm to con continue doing because it's important. We have to find these injustices and work to correct them. And there are, I mean, we've mentioned, okay, the Brooklyn District Attorney has overturned whatever, 20 cases in the last four years. And, and right, they're glorifying those cases. You know, it reminded me too, as, as John was telling the story, you know, they're glorifying the fact that they've overturned convictions. They're doing the right thing. They're doing the right thing. And it reminded me as he was telling the story, and I forget who the comedian is. It's not, I don't think it's Kevin Hart, but he, <laughs> he was talking about the comedian gets up there and he's on stage and he's like, oh, I love you know, my buddy comes up and he's like, oh, you don't have to tell me that. I pay for my kids. And he, and he's bragging about, I pay for my kids. And he's like, he looks at him, he's like, that's what you're supposed to do. Why are you bragging about something you're supposed to do? This is what Brooklyn has done. And, 
you know what? I got to give them a little bit of props because at least they are trying. There are other counties, New York County, Queens County. They're not trying. Staten Island just now got a conviction review unit. I don't think they've overturned anything yet. Brooklyn has been an example for those other counties. But slowly and surely, we, the people, are making a difference. We're insisting on it. There are marches. There are protests. And, and all of these things, the more people attend, again, because they're voted in to their office, they listen. When there's a, cloud, a, a, a crowd of five people outside, eh, you know, okay, yeah, that's nice. When there's a crowd of 500 people outside that represent 50,000 people that live in Brooklyn, now they're going to listen. And that's the way we get their attention, is by groups and gathering and spreading the word of truth, injustice. We need it. We insist on it. It's our system. It's not their system. We control or should control and must control how that system operates. Okay, and when we see an injustice and when we are uh, elect officials and elect DAs who see an injustice, we must insist it be corrected because that's what is supposed to happen. And, and Ramsey's case is a perfect example of, of what I'm talking about. And, and he's right. And he gave you a very, you know, it, it's hard. And I think he did a brilliant job of it. You know, this case is 35 years old and there are details and levels after level after level of the corruption that happened in his case. You know, we talked about one thing, this, this Brady violation. It's shocking to me. And I, I've done, I've been a lawyer for 22 years. I've probably done, you know, 250 trials in that time. What happened in his case is within an hour of the murder, which happened in a room half the size of this room, and there were six people in there, one was shot. There were witnesses in, in that room. Nobody else could see this crime. Within an hour, somebody called 911, reported the murder, described the individuals, the two individuals who committed the murder, and told the police where they were located. The police went to that location, and there's a, a police report that says this, that we discovered 33 years later, went to that location, arrested two individuals who fit the description and were at the location. That evidence was hidden from Ramsey and his attorney. That's important to know because it, as it turns out, as we know now, one of those two individuals was his co-defendant who pled guilty to the murder. The other one was his brother and who has now admitted, I mean, his co-defendant has now admitted that he was trying to protect his brother and it was his brother who was with him. Now, how important would that have been to a capable defense attorney to use at John Ramsey's trial? It wasn't Ramsey. He was identified, two other people were already identified as committing this crime by someone who, by the very nature of the crime, had to be in the room at the time when the murder happened because they could not have identified two people without watching the murder. Now, the sad thing and the, the hard part of trying to correct these wrongs 35 years later, a lot of these people are dead, right? The brother who Ramsey's co-defendant was trying to protect was murdered execution style within a year after this crime. Now that tells me something as well, because that to me is a revenge back and forth situation, right? We have dug, well, we, again, I gotta, I gotta compliment my, my, my client here. Um, <laughs> this guy has done, if, I would be out of work if I had clients, if all my clients were like him, because he basically came to me with, you know, and we didn't have that hidden document at the time, but he knew it must exist. And he had been requesting, requesting, requesting. He handed me the roadmap to his file and to the solution of overturning his case. And it's because, and it, it really, that's what made me believe in John Ramsey and his case, is because this guy's been working to prove his innocence for 35 years. 
and he's got the whole roadmap. He's, he's done these requests. He's got his entire file copied 18,000 times, stored in different facilities around the country. He knew his file better than anyone. And if you're gonna come and tell me, hey, please invest your time and money in my case, you better know your file and you better have tried to work on it in the last 35 years to, to prove your innocence because otherwise, maybe you're not really innocent. It, it's hard for me to decipher that. I had no doubt when I met him that he did not commit this crime and he has spent the last 35 years trying to prove it. Um, a couple other points, you know, I, I think details disappear over time and when it was amazing and he mentioned this briefly and again you know we brought some material if you're interested in in reading more about his case we filed a motion on march 7th because the district attorney wouldn't agree with us and i do think there's some political reasons behind that sorry february the 8th we filed the motion um the original return date was March 7th. That's what the date had confused me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we filed the motion because the district attorney hadn't agreed with us that it should be overturned. So we're asking a judge, read these facts, do the right thing, overturn his motion. We are going to court on May 7th to hopefully get that very result. Um, the motion we filed, we brought some copies of. We also brought a paper, we only brought five copies of the motion, but there's a link where you can go online and read the motion that we filed. It's powerful, it's powerful. It not only talks about um, the case in great detail, it talks about the, the blatant, obvious effort that the police and district attorney at the time made to hide uh, material from him so that they could win the case, um, which they did. And, and cause this man, and, and this I think is, is more to the point, they won a trial. He lost his life for something he didn't do. And, and that is the real tragedy in our society is the, the lack of compassion towards innocent people. They don't care. What they care for is the statistics of getting the conviction getting the arrest, putting in the books, I might get a promotion, I might get a raise. Well, you've destroyed this man's life forever. And he's right. Nothing will make up for that. He's never gonna get that back. He can't get it back. Overturned or not, he lost 33 years of his life and continues to lose aspects of it because he's still a convicted felon. And we're trying to, to justify that. We're trying to make that right. Um, and that would then put some truth back in justice. Um, but right now, we're missing that. And, and the only thing I think we can do is insist on it by, again, coming to these groups, protesting when we have them, organizing, demonstrating, showing the people in power we're not laying down. You're doing the wrong things. Start making it right. Whatever it takes, one step at a time. We're patient, but do the right thing. And that's it. You know, we, we must insist on that. And, you know, every election, we have an opportunity to correct these errors, right? And every election, we must unite and, and make our world better by electing the right people. And if they're not doing the job properly, time to go. That's it. And there's no, there's no other way to do it. And we must let them know that that's what we plan on doing. And the more people that speak up, the more quickly change will come. And that's why, again, I thank you for coming here, thanking you for your support. We will get this case overturned. Um, there's some new laws right now um, that I'm happy about. And again, the governor has pushed because people have insisted on it and it's a step in the right direction. Right now, an, an assistant district attorney, which is just an attorney who works for the DA, who is a prosecutor, if they hide evidence, even if it's intentional, 
and they say, you know what, I'm going to get this conviction. I'm going to hide this evidence so I can get a conviction. They can't be sued. They have immunity. They cannot be sued. That's wrong. And the people finally spoke up enough over the last several years to say, I'm sorry for saying this, but this is bullshit. You got to fix it. And the governor heard them finally. Last year, the end of last year, introduced a bill to take that immunity away. That's one step. Because if a prosecutor, when they're going to trial, knows that if we later discover that they hid evidence, they're going to jail. Maybe they won't hide the evidence. Maybe. It'll at least make them stop and think twice. So we're taking small steps and we're getting small victories. And that's what we have to keep doing is getting those small victories to make sure with justice is the truth. Not justice, we got a conviction, but there's no truth in it. That doesn't work. Because here's the thing. This is the sad thing. The person who really committed that crime, still out there running around. So not only do you ruin an innocent man's lives, uh, life, you never get the actual criminal. You got a conviction, but the real criminal's still out there running around. Um, so <laughs> I don't even remember what your question was, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you as much information as I can. But what I've done, and, and again, Ramsey and I, when I met him, we decided we wanted to find a law firm who would sponsor a project where we could find convicted criminals who are claiming they're innocent and can't get help, and we want to help them. And we did. We found a law firm to do that. Um, he has been our key investigator on the cases we work on. He goes out, he finds witnesses, he interviews them, he gets us the information we need, he gives us the insight that we need, which is invaluable. Um, he knows the people in prison who have always claimed they're innocent. Um, and that's invaluable. So it was really him that inspired me to take this to present it to a law firm who was large enough that they would sponsor a project to help people. And that's, that's pretty much how we got started. And, and I've, I've kind of been attached to him ever since, and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving us that well-rounded um, perspective on the climate of what's happening in not only New York State, but across the country. Um, and it's just, it's just a lot going on, and I'm, I'm grateful that you're taking this big step and continuing and not stopping. Um, and I wanted to get another perspective from Tanya, who um, I've known through memories and, and <laughs> um, a lot of uh, just childhood um, memories that he has shared and my mom has shared, and um, also Jerry as well. He's in the back. In the um, and you, and the impact of wrongful, wrongful, wrongful convictions is not just, you know, oh, is a statistic. Is the fact that family, that the person themselves are impacted by this. And I wanted to talk to you about if you could share with us about your impact from seeing a childhood friend go through this, as well as like how did it affect your career as a police officer, as a healer. Um, so kind of share that with us. Thanks, Good evening. I stand also. <laughs> I just have to breathe, I tell you. Um, you know, he talks about bitter and, you know, and you hear it all the time. No, I'm not upset. I'm, 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 I'm not upset about what was done. You know, I'm just glad I'm free. But are you really free? Like he said. And, um, Given it a different type of spin, um, I had a brother that was wrongly convicted, and I was a witness to something that he did not do, and I know he went to jail for something that he did not do. And this is prior to um, John's case, and the reason why in which I became a police officer. I did not want to become a police officer. I did not like police officers. Police officers kicked my door in. They dragged my brothers out and 
in their underwear and they beat them up. That's all I knew about police officers. But I also knew that in order to be able to fight a system, you had to know how the system worked. So while I was in high school, I think I was about 16 years old, so like a junior high school, a teacher came to, to me, you know, the class and said, you know, there's, there's city exams coming out, you know, the police exam is coming out and different things of that nature. Take the test. And if you don't want the job, you don't have to take it. And I took the test. And I remember with so many people standing out there with so many people, you know, um, taking that test that particular day and um, Eastern District High School. I'll never forget that. And um, I took the test and I actually forgot about it. I was working at a law firm and I was going to college uh, to become a, an accountant from college. I had no, 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 no idea I wanted to be a police officer, but at that time my brother was convicted of the crime and I was going to prison to visit him and his case came about and, you know, so many other cases came about and I'm young and I'm a good girl, you know, I never did anything wrong. So I wouldn't be involved in a system like this, but the way the system worked, I could be snatched off the street like a criminal in the night and also be convicted of something that I did not do. So I don't know. I just thought that accountant, accounting seemed all of a sudden it seemed kind of boring to me. And I said, I'm going to do this the rest of my life. I want to do something exciting. I want to do something that's worthy. I want to do, I want to help people. And, um, the, I got a letter in the mail that said that if you still, you know, are interested in the job and I was about 21 years old and you said he was about 21 years old when he went in and I made the decision to become a police officer because people were getting arrested back in, in the neighborhood and in my family and nobody knew anybody that was a police officer or, or a lawyer. That was like a big deal, you know, back then. And I said, well, I'm going to take the job. And I remember I had four older brothers that said to me, you want to be down with the pigs? And I'm like, what are you talking about? We, somebody needs to know what this is all about. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to get information. And I promise you, I'm going to not just do this because, you know, it, it's a status symbol. I'm going to do it because I'm going to help people to understand what the law is all about. Mm -hmm. So they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. And so I went in when I was 21. And again, I think about him being 21. And I was just young and I, and I didn't know the streets. I didn't know nothing about the streets. I didn't hang out in the streets. I didn't know nothing about the streets. When I got put in the street, I got put in uh, Brownsville, East New York, Bed-Stuy in 1985. And it was, it was dangerous out there. If you didn't know the streets and how to deal with people, how to talk to talk and walk to walk, I don't care what you did. With a gun and a badge, you get your butt kicked out there. But I went out there, and at the end of the day, they're just people. So I went to talking to people and just connecting with people. And I said, you know what? And that's when they were pay phones and they weren't cell phones that, you know, you, 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 you used upside down. <laughs> and um, I said, you know, I'm out here with people that if the police can't come and assist me, if I'm in trouble, these people are going to help me if I'm out there helping them. So there were times that I would, you know, if there was an arrest situation, I would tell the person, listen, you have a right to m remain silent. Shut your mouth because it's going to be held against you. There were times I, I, I did some things to help the, the, the defendant or the perp or the perpetrator based on the fact that I knew that they were getting railroad right there in the precinct. Mm -hmm. Things that I was not supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? Risking my job. But at the end of the day, I knew it was wrong. So I was there to get the information, extract the information and give it to the, to, to the people, anybody that wanted to listen, you know, they, they call me, you know, black power girl or, you know, whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, I'm about justice. I'm about the truth. That's the way I was raised. I was raised on the truth. You tell the truth, the truth shall set you free. Sometimes you got to fight for your, for the truth. And this is what he's doing. This man here, I, you know, I thought I knew the law. I knew nothing about the law. This man would come, like you said, one o'clock, two o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, whatever, Tanya, I got to tell you this. I got to do, 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 And I got to tell you this. And sometimes I didn't understand what he was talking about, but I would listen and eventually it would process and I would get it. And you know, the more and more I got it, I was like, 
this is crazy. I can't believe it. I would visit him in, in prison too. And I would hear him over the phone and I would hear the discouragement in his voice. Like, you know, my sister died. I don't know if my mother's going to be alive. I can't do this anymore. This is crazy. I'm not supposed to be here, but I'm like, you know, just hold, you know, I wouldn't say too much to him over the phone, but in my mind, I would say the, the prayers would be, hold on brother. You strong. You're the, in there for a reason. You're in there for a reason. You're going to come out stronger than you ever went in. You're going to be all right. And when it finally came to the time where, you know, I don't, you know, been to the parole board, how many times I said, John, do what you got to do. Say what you got to say, get out of there and fight your fight from the outside looking in. So this is what he's done. And I'm telling you, man, he's encouraged me to be strong in so many situations and, you know, to become the private investigator. I never thought I'd become a private investigator. I really didn't like policing. I like being out there with the people. I worked in community affairs. I worked with the kids in school prevention, prevention, prevention. So if you went, you know, it's so easy to go to jail, but in, in prison, it's so hard to get out. You know, I used to tell the kids, you can't even afford to go to jail. You know what I mean? And I worked in the school systems for seven years with prevention for drugs, alcohol, jail. We used to do scared straight programs. We ran programs during the summertime to prevent, you know, keep the kids off the street, allow them to know that you're better than this. You know, at the end of the day, sometimes you're, you're dragged into situations that, you know, you really don't want to peer pressure and all of the above. But at the end of the day, John and I are like brother and sister. And um, Craig, you're my brother too. <laughs> and I mean, because he talked about Craig so much. It's like I knew him before I met him. But I mean, it's the strongest man I ever knew. And at the end of the day, we, as like you said, the people are strong and powerful. There's more of us than them. Mm -hmm. And we have to let them know, you're not going to railroad us anymore. Mm -hmm. Mothers are not going to cry on a bus at, at night, 12 o'clock midnight, taking those buses upstate somewhere where you've never been before. All you see is grass and trees. And, and, and when you get there, you see people that you've never seen before and they've never seen you either. And they treat you like the dirt on their boots. You know, the story is not just, like you said, the 22 or 23 convictions that were overturned. It's countless numbers of children that were affected and cousins and, and, and uncles and aunts that lose contact with their family members because of something that you wanted to do, that you wanted to get a promotion. You, you want to be a first grade detective and make this money, or you working behind the scenes in the DA's office because that's behind the scenes. People always think, oh, the police are doing this, the police are doing that. But at the end of the day, the police can't do it with the handshake of the DA's office. Okay. When you get arrested, when you, when you're arrested, you're arrested on the street, you go to the precinct, uh, the desk officer sit behind the desk. They ask you what you got. Okay. They want to know what the charge is after you've searched your, your prisoner and you've uh, started making your, your, your contacts, the DA's office is called and they have to okay that arrest for probable cause. And then they add whatever other charges to that arrest. So they, they, are the, the, they are the behind the scenes people. You think it's just the police or the police are this or the police are that. They cannot do it with the D, without the DA's office. Did you know that? Did you understand that? It's a process and that's the beginning of the criminal justice system. That's just what it is. So with that said, we can talk till we blue in the face. At the end of the day, like Craig was saying, you got to make change. And the change comes from laws being changed. This is the way it is, but it's not the way it's going to stay. And it's up to us to make that change. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, we're going to open it up to questions um, from the audience. Or is there anyone who has any questions to ask um, our panel? Any questions? Because you can't take back that time. She said it's much more eloquently 
in a certain type of fire. And that particular moment, you encapsulated it. You brought the spirit of Muhammad Ali in the room. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, I see what this is. So the queen next to you revealed to me what I was going to ask, and I'm going to ask the question, because she said at a particular moment in time, she had, she had encouraged you that you're there for a reason. And so I, I, I understand the power of work, and I understand the power of time. So my question to you is, is when, when during the process, without going into details, you had that shift where you decided that I'm, I, I have a resolve, I need to get out of here. Because in our brief conversation, you mentioned men that were locked up for a short period of time, and they didn't know that they they don't walk this way. Uh, I always had that resolve. <laughs> what she's actually talking about, it was a period, a very small period, where my sister passed away. And me and my sister was extremely, extremely close. I never had no one that I was close with ever passed away. And during that process, I was talking to my sister. Actually, I'm a backup. 1996, I was in Attica Yard. When I'm in Attica Yard, I'm on the phone with her. And this is prior to her cancer. It's prior to that. And she says, you got to come home. Mama is getting old. In prison, there's a certain survival element. You either on the back or you're on the front. I'm on the front, meaning I'm not letting nobody do nothing to me, period. Any scar you see on me, I had that when I was a little kid. I didn't take nothing from prisoners. I didn't take nothing from police. It didn't matter to me. That's where my resolve come in, survival. The time she's talking about is when my sister passed away. And sometimes you get to the point like, hey, you in there for something you didn't do. Keep that in mind. So now you losing the strongest elements of your life, right? So in your mind, you like, damn, if my mom's dying, I don't know what I'll do. Or my niece passed away, my nephew. You know, these are people that's directly close to me. I don't have a big family tree, period. If I talk about my family, my family consists of not only my biological family through DNA. I take her, I take him, I take my man Jerry, his wife. That's my family tree. And I have family in jail. You adopt to the realistic aspect of it, where when you go to prison, there's a strong element of separation that occurs. You will see who's what and who's who. Then when you come home, which is kind of really crazy, where you get people saying, oh, I love you, I miss you, but you didn't see me in 33 years. Now, what kind of love is that? What kind of, how do you put that in love? You know, I believe if I actually had a pet, a pit bull or dog, would probably come see me more than that so-called family would have. And I ain't talking about my media. I'm talking about cousins, uncles, and all that. You know, I had Jerry. He's in the back. I grew up with him. He came to see me more than any of that particular family. So a lot of times, you know, there's a realistic level to being able to see what's real and what's not. When I talk, you'll see me always referring to guys as brothers. I don't care if you're white, black, Spanish, I don't care about none of that. You always start out that way with me until you show me something different. He been with me since we met. And there's no argument without success. Always remember that. Me and him argue countless times. 
but that's why we're going to be so successful and have been so successful. There was times that my intelligence was questioned. And here, 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 tell you this, right? And another lawyer that we had, because I like this. Not by me. Not, not at all. And he was a part of our team. And he actually thought he had a monopoly of sense. He just knew everything. And there's no way I could know anything. And it's like every suggestion, legal suggestion I put up here, knock it down, knock it down. But eventually he left for whatever reason, he's gone. And it became me and him. We took a trip to Florida on a case. It was Orlando, yeah, Orlando, Florida, we went there. And we actually drove down there, or he drove. He ain't trust my driving. He ain't, he ain't trust my driving at the time. You know what I mean? He, he ain't think I could whip it. <laughs> and when we went down there, this is when we started bonding. He getting to know my mindset. And then, you know, after we got back, this lawyer wound up getting, you know, going wherever he's going. And I started networking. He knows I'm, I'm, I'm a network king. You know, I'll meet people that you don't expect me to meet, period. And at that time, he didn't know why. He always talks about this. He always questioned me, why are you meeting all these lawyers and these different people? And it wasn't until months later, eight, nine months later, he realized I'm making us stronger. You know, we don't need no actual defense lawyer right by we outsource and we build up a team and that's what i am I'm, I'm 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 a team player and i know in order to be victorious in anything is about power straight up you get guys that come home from prison i'm pretty much the contrary of them not all but 90 something percent of them I didn't come home like seeking this big money day. I, I didn't seek none of that. I network, I seek power and I sacrifice. I sacrifice wearing certain sneakers I want, shirts or whatever. I didn't care about none of that. Because when you're in prison, that's the number one thing you don't have is power. You have nothing. You could think you have power, you have nothing. You could put in motions, they could be dynamite motions you put in. But if you ain't got no dynamite power behind you, it goes unheard. So I knew that having resolve wasn't had nothing to do with my actual doing time. My transition happened many moons ago while I was in prison. You get guys, you people ask, you know, you transition. How did you trans? Matter of fact, last week somebody asked, but this has been asked to me quite a few times. You know, how was your transition back into society? Which is really don't make any sense. If you really think about it, it's actually the reverse question that you should be asking. How did you transition into prison? Because society is where I come from. I was born in the street. I wasn't born in the penitentiary. So what transition do I have to make out here? Nothing. Yeah, you got phones, technology. That's not really a transition. That's just learning. You just learn that. It's not an actual transition. You're not going into a total different culture. I didn't see it as a different culture. Because when I was in prison, I remained current, relevant, and resourceful. Because I was networking in it. I started a company even in jail. I didn't know much about it, but I ventured. That's just my nature. I ventured. I never secluded myself from reality. You get guys that get caught up in the prison culture. I mean, they caught up. And I know guys that's in there now that have been in the box for 28, 29 years because you got caught up in the culture. I knew in my mind that that wasn't going to be my end. That's not my end game. 
I got too much ideas and imagination to be stuck in there like that. So I had to make a concerted change because when you go in prison, you know, this is the reality of it. You got to create a reputation for yourself. You'll never hear a person say, oh, I, I smacked Ramsey, or I took Ramsey food, or I sexually abused. You'll never hear that from no one. Zero. The parole officer I had, who was a great friend of mine today, he used to go to different people that he had as parolees. He always asked me, what's up, man? He's the real deal. Serious. He's consistent. Same way I went in, the same way I came out. There was no changes. I got more educated, more disciplined, but the core of me is the same. There's no different. When I speak about, when I spoke to my mother when I first came home, and I'm telling her, you ain't never got the word, because I was in the streets. I know the streets well as anybody. And I took what I know now to start an investigative company. Tanya that was sitting here, I had her go get a license. Yes, she's a licensed investigator. And I, I worked on serious cases. Some of the cases I work on and some of the people that I work for, you would never believe. Without a doubt. Most of your investigators, 99.9% .9 of them, and I'm probably that 1%, they are retired New York City cops. Because you got to have three years of law enforcement in order to get your license, but anybody can be an investigator. So what I did, I had Tanya, yeah, 20 years, go get your license. And we get down together. And I don't just do the bare minimum of it. I don't, I don't just do the bare. I get the whole file, which no investigator does. Not one of them does that. I can, he can tell you anything that comes into the office, he passes to me to review and we go back and forth on it. And my thing is, is that no one can relate better than me. Not one of them. They can't go into the prisons and, and, and sit down with them. There's not a prisoner that wouldn't trust me. And what they fail to realize a lot of times is you get like certain firms or certain lawyers, they don't realize that these clients know their case better than you can ever know. It. They've been living with it. Not all of them. They, they've been living with it. So when it comes to investigation, they give you an idea of what direction to go on. They give you an idea of it. And I use my own sense of direction. And even in my own case, he'll tell you, we worked on it, worked on it. And, you know, I, I always give him credit. And he always give me credit because I believe in the collective body of work. You know, it has nothing to do with, oh, I created this ankle, I did this, or I did. It's, it's not about that. You know, it, it's about having the wit. You know, you got some wit. Some things he have told me, and I'd be like, yeah, you're right, because I'd be moving off emotions. You know, and sometimes I'd be stubborn about things, but he'll tell you. He'll tell me something today, and I'd be adamant about it. I'd be arguing with him. Nah, I'm telling you, Craig, this is... And the next day I come in the office, I say, you know what? You was right about that. I make him repeat it. You so. <laughs> <laughs> was right about that. However, there's another shoe to that. There's a lot of times, and I mean a lot, <laughs> that I didn't tell him that, look, this is what it is. And I break it down. And he always put me in a position to qualify my position, which I'm actually good at because it's my position. It's something that I process. And I always break it down. And what I like about him he never dismisses my thinking. And he would say, Ramsey, you're right. Let's go with it. 
Or it could be a situation where we doing something and I said, nah, make this call or whatever. And he won't see my reasoning behind it. And I will break it down, though, just ask, blah, blah, blah. And when it come back, it said, you was right again. <laughs> because being in prison, do you know how many people and how many personalities and characters consist in prison? You don't have, let me tell you something. I look at, like you got a lot of mental health out here, right? And it's crazy because I'm like an expert on dealing with them. Because I dealt with them in prison. I made it my business to learn schizophrenic. I learned about all that. I made it my business to learn that. You know, that's why I don't like dogs like that. Because I can't really get into their head. <laughs> <laughs> Because I can't, I can't get in it because they don't speak my language. <laughs> so you'll see a dog coming, and you'll see me walk across the other side. <laughs> because you, because I can't, it's not that I don't like them, it's just that I don't know what you're thinking. So in prison, you have maybe about, only depends what jail you're in. It may be in a jail where you got 300 people in one block or whatever. And like when I was in Sullivan, I was there for 16 years. This is one particular jail. And guys would come in. I think it's about 64 people in that one block. And I remember when Son of Sam came in, right? This is 1987. Prior to that, they had moved somebody out the block, right? They moved somebody out the block. And when they moved them out the block, I'm asking the CO, yo, this correction officer, use the term CO, who's coming in? He said, David Berkowitz. And I'm like, hey, Berkowitz, David Berkowitz. Then it dawned on me, son of Sam. I'm very, very analytical. Very. Some people say I'm too much analytical, but I analyze. So when he came in, I used to watch him, just watch him, get a feel for him, you know? And crazily, he used to get the most mail. Literally, he's get the most mail. He's get the most mail. And after probably about five or six months, I started talking to him. I like getting in the heads of people. And very well mannered. You would never think that he was charged with that actual charge that they gave him. You, you would never. If you've seen him today, you would never. He could walk in here. You would never suspect anything. And he was like part of the beginning of me, starting processing people, processing. Even from him to Mark Chapman to John Lennon, even with him, I've met most people, you know, that had horrific crimes or been involved with this, from mobsters to everything. And Jerry will tell you, he went to an auto body shop here. I was still in jail. The guy was telling him about a friend of his that was in prison. Well-known mobster, daily news, books on him, and everything. And Jerry mentioned him. He said, yo, this guy was mentioned. I wanted to mention the name. He said, how did you know that? I said, because I know. You know what I mean? I just have a sense of who you're talking about. There's people. And I, I love dealing with people. I, I love it. I just don't like dealing with dogs. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I can't deal with that because I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. But when it comes to people, you know, it it it, it, it pays to know that. You know, so my interaction. I love interacting with people. You know, you may look at my situation. Oh, he's in jail 33 years. But if I never told you that, you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that. You know what I mean? And I take pride in that, that a person would never know that. Craig, we was going to Florida that day, right? When this man said, yo, you want to stay at my house, who takes me in their house? Do you understand what I'm saying? I did 33 years in prison. He got two daughters and a wife, and he offered me to his house. And that was like a sealer for me. You know what I mean? I take, 
certain things very high. You know, certain people have certain bars that they use to determine whether a person is their friend. Mine is a little different. You know, my determination is totally different because I didn't been around the worst, the half of the worst, the greater the worst, and the doodle of the worst. <laughs> so I know the real from the fake. Anyone that knows me, they know I don't be around people often. The people I've been around are the people that I trust. The people that I really, really regard. I don't hang out in no street. I don't go to clubs. I don't do none of that stuff. I'm strictly doing what I do. I came home. I got married. You know, I, I did the, the greatest the greatest things that, you know, fold your life up. I'm about family. That, that's what I'm about. You know, anybody, he'll tell you I'm always asking about, you know, how the girl's doing. That's his daughter's, his wife. Same thing with her. I always ask the people how your family doing because that's the extension of everything to me that we stand for. Because when you don't have that, you basically don't have nothing. You don't have nothing. And I ain't talking about just, you know, your family do DNA. I'm talking about family, family, people that you consider. And I consider him my family, or my family. The people that's really, really with you, you know, they kids. That means everything to me because that is the beginning to my end. When I'm gone, that's the beginning of it. You know what I mean? When I look at certain situations, you know, that people may have in which I had to learn. I had to learn this because I was being very, very insensitive because I took my situation as the greatest situation. Uh, what you talking about, that, that's, that's minor stuff. You ain't really been through nothing. But we're talking about two different standards. For that person's standards, that's severe. You understand? For my standards, it may not be severe. But through my transitioning, I made it my severe now. Because now I understand. I can't take my bar and use it for everyone else. So someone may come to me, or somebody's kid may come to me, even the young brother there. I met him, young brother right here. I met him about a year ago or something. They were shooting the, um, what's that, Tracy Morgan movie. And a friend of mine that was close to Tracy Morgan called me down there. I went down there. It was basically, you know, the projects area. So I went down there. So I had parked my car where all the movie people was parking their car. And the guy says, oh, you got you to gotta move. I said, come on, man, give me a shot. Man. He said, ah, I'm going to let you stay there. So I stood there. So I'm on the block. So a friend of his went to my car to open the door. Not the average person would be like, yo, what are you touching my car for? So I said, yo, bro, what are you, what are you doing? I got a smile on because it's a way you got to present yourself. You know, you got three levels of communication. You got aggressive communication, you got passive communication, you got conservative communication. And you got to know how to interchange them when necessary. So I knew not to come, yo, brother, what, what, you, do, what, what you doing touching my car? That automatically breathes off with aggressive communication. So I smiled, I said, yo, he said, oh man, I thought it was my man's car, which he wasn't lying. Because his man had an Ollie. I didn't know he has an Ollie. So now we start talking. And I tell him my situation. He says, yeah, I said, yeah, we start kicking it. And that's how I met him. You know, I met him. We started talking. And I told him, anytime you need somebody to talk to or whatever, just holler at me. And that's how it's been. Any situation he come up with, I talk to him about it. Because this is something that I never really had coming up. My pops was, I'm being honest. My pops wasn't there for me like that. You know what I mean? I'm keeping it 100. So being in prison, I always was like that. The superintendent wrote a letter to the parole board for me and spoke about that. 
you know, the lives that I've changed inside of prison. Because I believe that everyone is not made up the same. Everyone don't have the same gifts. Everybody can't think exactly alike. Everybody don't have the same resolve. They don't have all of that. Some people have shortcomings. And when you really look at the pole of it all, we all have shortcomings. We all got it. Some people that I have to go to to help me get to where I need to get to, business-wise, because I fall short in that particular area. So I'm never ever, I'll never look down on people, you know, and I even told my wife this, we talking about something. I said, one thing you'll never know, I'm never hating on nobody. When I look at people, you know, that's successful, I don't ever look at them with jelly eyes. Still got a Rolls Royce. See, I never do that because it took hard work for that person to get there. So you never dismiss that. When people, they may say, oh, man, Ramsey, you lucky. You got these law firms. Uh, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. Ain't no such thing as luck. So you telling me all my effort, everything I did was based on luck. It wasn't no work. It's work. I'm just persistent. Only took me four years to get to where I'm at right now. And it's going to take me four more years to get past that. And it's going to take me four more years to finish it off. Because when you have a certain desire, and I love desire, because desire is what moves people. And you look at people and you say, Man, why this person ain't doing this? It could be a guy holding the door at McDonald's and he got the cup out, you know, for 10, 15 cents or whatever. A lot of times, and I met a person, I'm going to use this person as an example, there's nothing wrong with him. I know that for a fact. Nothing wrong with him, except that he had no desire. That was it. He had no mental impairment. He took that as an actual hustle. So everybody have their own particular ways. And I, I don't look down on people. And I learned that from being in the penitentiary, being looked down on. When you got, you know, family members saying, ah, oh, in jail for murder, da 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 But now, <laughs> we in a different quarter of this game now. Now you look at me, Oh, how you doing? Da, da, da. You want to be a part of it because now you see the truth coming out. But I'm not the type that go that way and go back. There's no going back for me. You know what I mean? Because I always look at the fact, what if I didn't make it? What if I didn't make it? What if I didn't have the sense to make it? And you just totally abandoned me. Totally abandoned. What if I had no sense of ever making it and you abandoned me like that and I never made it out? And the truth never came out. And you sitting at your home living a lie. Because what you believe is a lie. It ain't the truth. So I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. That's it. But uh, I appreciate I, I really appreciate you guys coming. You know, it means a lot to me. You know what I mean? It, it really, really do. And I look to do more of this because I, I enjoy interacting with people. You know, I, I love, you know, sitting here with Craig and Tanya because I spend my time with them. You know what I mean? And I just hope that you guys support what we're doing if not me per se, support the issue. You know what I mean? Because it's, 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 it's clear. And, you know, what these DAs and these officers, and I ain't talking about all DAs. I ain't saying the 360 DAs that sat the Brooklyn D, all of them bad. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. You know what I mean? But support the wrongful policies that they use in convicting us. Because it's clear, and it don't stop. I mean, this 2016, you got this judge actually talking about discovery. 
You have to turn over everything. Why does she have to be telling them that? It's law. But you got the judge enforcing you to do that. So that's you know, that's it for me. I really appreciate y'all coming. God or ungod, all of you. <laughs> you try to figure that out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to Craig and Tanya for sharing. Um, and it's, it's amazing that you are so strong. I know you as Uncle, uh, Uncle Pee Wee. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, don't, don't say. Yeah. <laughs> so besides the cell phone, but, but he, he's been an inspiration to me for, for a long, long time. Um, and, I'm happy to be your roommate for life, but I know you got a wife, so you know. <laughs> You're always welcome to come back to, to the to the um to, to the house. And um I have some information here to share. This is just this is this continuation of all the momentum that he has started, that they have started together. And um I just just look out for the documentary, look out for next steps, and I thank you so much and thank you for just welcoming us to this beautiful space um, and definitely come join the mailing list um, because there's so many other stories out here that Abhe and, and Justin and the rest of the team have to share. Um, it's not just an artist focus, it's also about just injustices that are happening across the world. So definitely come and support this gallery as well. So thank you so much and share and, and you wanna say a couple of things? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, oops. Thank you, Shante. Thank you, John, Craig, Tanya. You're welcome to come back anytime. You know, I think all of us, without even asking them, I can see it on their face. Everyone has goosebumps just listening to your experiences, your fight, and your resolve. It's really, uh, really inspiring. So thank you. Um, and like I said, you're welcome to come back anytime. This gallery is your gallery. Use it anytime that you want, you know, because we must get the word out. Yeah. And um, there's wine for those of you who like some, and uh, QA for uh, them if you wish to. Uh, we'll be open till as late as you want to stay. Uh, I know the owner, so I'll work it out with him. And, <laughs> and uh, thank you again. Yeah. And please leave your email um, addresses. Uh, it's, on a, it's on a book in the back. And it's been live cast on Facebook. So if you go to Gallery AWA on Facebook, uh, you'll be able to take the link and forward it on to your friends who missed it because we must get the word out. So thank you again. And thank you, Shante.